too much time introducing ourselves this afternoon because we don't have much time before lunch. So um, just a quick intro from each of the panellists and then we'll dive straight into some questions. So um, as I was introduced, I'm of counsel at Simmons & Simmons. I have been a uh, practising as a lawyer in emerging markets for the last 15 years or so and work primarily in projects and finance space. So um, we're going to kick off with Walter who will give a short introduction to his himself, um, but I will start with the questions and you can follow up. So it has been said that you have been building the internet since 1994, um, and now as the founder of a Pan-African cloud and data center operator, you are contributing to the growth of data across the continent. Please could you give us your insights into the growth potential for Africa as a key digital infrastructure market and what the potential for key data centre and technology hubs in the region is. Uh, yeah. Hi, does this work? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, uh, Bart van Houten, founder of uh, PEX Data Centres. Um, better known from our previous uh, company was Interaction, uh, but that's uh, now uh, history and now I'm building data centres and operating data centres on the African continent. We're live in Ghana and Kenya. Last week we announced Djibouti and there's land purchased in Dakar and Abidjan and soon also Kigali. So we got a nice pipeline of projects in the African continent. Uh, 1.2 billion people. Uh, was it the Africa CEO Forum in Kigali last week? And the talk of the town was about AI. Yet there are no data centers to power the AI. So it's, that was an interesting observation, and we have a lot of infrastructure to be built yet on the African continent. Um, great news of today is Google announcing more connectivity with the uh, cable from Australia to South Africa, and then, then goes onwards to connect Kenya, and more of that network infrastructure is needed. And which will then enable our data centers to flourish around the continent. Um, this morning, a little talk also, Bruno made some really interesting comments about some of these more challenging uh, regions where we're trying to build. And uh, top of mind is cost of capital, equipment cost, safety standards. We can talk about that for a whole day. And renewable energy, how we get access to that. Yeah, then uh, stakeholder management, also a key topic. Uh, how do we make sure that when we invest in these markets that we are fully engaged? Um, so there's quite a lot, a lot to talk about, uh, but uh, maybe as, as a short intro, it was some of the things that are top of mind uh, for, for me. Yeah. So a great growth potential then? And, well, what's key is, of course, that some of our uh, customers are, you know, understanding now what, what the challenge is on the African continent and starting to make these commitments to deploy their infrastructure there, which is great because that's that's the business we, we, we want to be in. So then our customers are uh, telecom operators, and cloud providers, digital content distribution networks, uh, banks. The whole outsourcing movement is starting to take place in these markets once there's sufficient fiber. Of course, a long way to go in many markets. So let's talk to some of the people investing in these markets and um, let them tell us what their views are. So I'll start with Fabian Sida on my left from FinFund. Um, so Fabian, as a, a development financier and an impact investor um, in this market and recognising that each country has its own strengths um, in the market, a couple of, a pro and con question for you. Um, what are the key drivers that make this an attractive market? you 
Um, and then what are the biggest challenges you would associate when investing in this sector? Hi everyone, um, I said my name is Quinn Tisa, uh, investment manager at Fund, um, and maybe to, to take this question because I think as we've mentioned with 50 plus countries it's, it's quite quite difficult and you have to generalize a lot probably to, to, to give an answer here but I think for, for some of the markets and that would exclude maybe the, the more developed markets so Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa but if you look at smaller markets, um, for example Ethiopia where you have favorable demographics where you have a huge population um, we have high political risk, so really not not that much existing infrastructure. Um, and if you can come in the, in there as a first or second player and really establish an operating standard and and and, and be present and also educate uh, both both companies within the market and then pull demand from outside in, I think you 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 have a quite attractive value proposition. And and the theme I think that you will hear very often when especially with regards to legacy, is, is, is that demand will come. Uh, so the question is not if it will come, but, but, but when it will come. So whether it's in three years, five years, ten years, uh, it probably depends a whole lot on macroeconomics, on effects, on, on just f issues that, that affect every foreign investor looking to, to, to enter those markets. Uh, but, but probably as, 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 as what uh, Andreas would be able to tell, it's, those are markets that are, that are quite attractive. And obviously, as a foreign investor or as a DFI, a private investor, you, you have to have the, the kind of right ticket size to enter those markets. Like if you expect hyperscale type of returns or, an, or a ticket size that is just very big, you will not find those there. But it's really early, early stage, so I think that's a, that's a massive problem there. And for cons, I think uh, those are high risk markets, those are high country risk markets for every investment. It doesn't matter within this sector, just in general, if you do equity debt across the sectors. Um, you face issues with effects, with regulation. Um, so, so I think quite, quite generic issues that, that maybe affect all those countries or most of them. And I think we'll come back to a few of those in a bit more detail in the panel, but that's, that's a good introduction. Thank you, Fabian. Um, Ed, maybe to you, um, as an investor, uh, in, in this market, we know you're keen always to be doing more. Um, noting that we have those hubs like Lagos, Nigeria, Cape Town, um, which attract the most funding um, in Africa with, with Cairo and, and Johannesburg ranking close behind. Um, is there a question around competition for you and, and, and what markets you then look at? Um, and then Separately, touching on some of the topics that were talked about earlier in relation to um, issues around power generation, do you see uh, the, the energy sector, the renewable power sector, sort of ESG and sustainability all playing into to these markets as well? Thanks, uh, thanks Joanne. Um, so, so maybe just as a quick introduction, Ed Stumpf, uh, I'm the Investment Director and Head of Investment Strategy for AIM. Um, AIM is a private equity investor, we've got a portfolio of about $3 billion uh, of assets under management and a large share of that is in both the digital infrastructure and energy transition sectors across about 20 countries um, on the continent. Um, maybe just before touching on competitive dynamics, I mean I think it is worth just reiterating why we are um, extremely positive on digital infrastructure. And I think um, the reality is that whilst we're seeing a lot of macroeconomic headwinds driven by high inflation, um, high interest rates and declining sovereign indebtedness on the continent, uh, we like all investment themes which are driven by secular demand tailwinds. And I think uh, where there's a level of, shall we say, disassociation with the broader macroeconomic uh, or GDP growth trajectories. Data and digital infrastructure is one of those. We're seeing, as was mentioned during the IFC presentation, data volume growth rates that exceed anywhere else in the world and a lot of that is driven by smartphone adoption and by a rise in consumption per smartphone. So we're very positive in general but I think it's important to note the markets differ fundamentally. So you know if you look at the South African market where I live, um, all the international data center operators have arrived. We've got an inc incredibly vibrant digital ecosystem. We probably have 70 plus fiber networks operating in the country and we've got probably a few hundred internet service providers in addition to the mobile network operators. Um, when you uh, leave South Africa, um, in general terms, you see markets that are not nearly as ecosystem oriented, 
uh, value chains are still quite integrated and internet access is still highly dominated by mobile internet access. Um, so the opportunities we look at vary quite a lot. In South Africa we're seeing the very big data center operators, Digital Realty, Equinix and Vantage, all pursuing extremely aggressive uh, expansion strategies, probably amounting to hundreds of megawatts over the next couple of years. And a lot, is that, a lot of that has been driven by the, the, the significant arrival of hyperscale uh, players in the market. Um, in many other markets on the continent, um, the, the scale of, for instance, data center deployment is still significantly smaller, and quite a lot of it is still driven by local enterprise demand as opposed to hyperscale or cloud demand. Um, but we are seeing that starting to happen. And as AIM, for instance, we've acquired um, the largest operator in the Moroccan uh, market recently, and we're looking to expand that across a few regional markets. Um, and similarly, I think we're investing in uh, fiber, particularly access fiber, because that's necessary to drive further demand growth, um, as well as in telecoms towers densification. So in a market like DRC, we are aggressively rolling out towers because that market has both a need for increased coverage as well as a need for greater densification as the market transitions to 5G. And then without taking too much time, I think it is worth saying that on the energy side, that's probably what excites us most. And the markets that excite us most are markets where we see liberalization of regulatory frameworks for energy. Uh, historically in Africa and in most markets, um, you had a choice of either doing better generation on your site or you had a choice of trying to sell power to a utility. Many of those utilities are extremely fiscally constrained and, and in many cases are not in a position to, to give you the credit comfort to enter into long-term contracts. Um, in many markets now, I think this is in response to a critical capacity deficit for power, we're seeing governments open the markets to allow for transportation of power through the state grids and private-to-private -private wheeling of, of power to occur. And this is a massive change that's happened in South Africa within the last 12 months. The government has completely abolished the need for licenses to generate power. And so should a player like us wish to provide power to a big data center like Terraco or MTN, we can do so. And we can do so by aggregating different types of renewable energy on the back end to approximate a base load. So for instance, in South Africa, we have staggeringly good wind resource, but the wind is, blowing at, uh, is always blowing somewhere. South Africa, and if you aggregate enough wind farms together with solar, you will be able to provide power that penetrates about 80% of a data center's load instead of 20 or 30% as would be possible on a solar only strategy. And so, this is transformative, and we're seeing this type of strategy uh, become a, a real game changer in the ability to uh, deploy renewable energy at very large scale, but potentially even sell it to players that, that need smaller scale, that have smaller scale demand. That same trajectory we expect to follow Egypt, in Morocco, Kenya has gazetted regulations to allow it. Even Nigeria, albeit the issues do vary, and in some markets the grids um, are, are wholly inefficient and will require significant strengthening to allow those strategies to play out. Thank you, Adam. Um, very sort of uh, common or, or well-known discussion in the sort of energy energy sector there, and, and watching the, the South African market go from sort of licenses under one megawatt not required to 100 megawatts to now completely liberalization in a very short sense uh, period of time. It's been like crazy from kind of a regulatory perspective, but tells the story of, of kind of ESCOM, I guess. No, exactly, and I think, you know, what's interesting is, I mean, we prospect for digital infrastructure in South Africa, but it's fair to say the major operators are not short of capital to deploy in that market, but they are short of energy. So in many respects, the main investment opportunity for us is energy, because if you're a major data center operator, it doesn't mean that you've secured, how can I say, options over the best um, plots of farmland for deploying solar, for instance. Um, and we're very pleased to have Stella with us today as well. And just, um, we'll let Stella introduce herself in a moment, but Stella's going to, to talk to us about another aspect of what the, the digital infrastructure market can do for the growth in, in Africa. Um, and in the context of the Africa diaspora, um, Stella, how do you see this playing into developing countries and the potential growth of the digital infrastructure sector there? I'll start first uh, maybe presenting myself. Um, so I am a digital infrastructure builder, uh, more or less. I scream out loud on the internet about our secretive uh, industry. 
but I'm also a business uh, infrastructure developer, uh, specialized on the country of Rwanda, which is quite a very moving country, so if people are interested. <laughs> um, okay, about the African diaspora, um, firstly, it's a, an aspect that is uh, quite underestimated or underrated and underutilized, uh, I would say. Um, first, because um, the African diaspora uh, in itself, because it has a dual uh, approach, uh, first uh, on the local continent and on um, international uh, level also, of the socio-economical and cultural uh, um, uh, aspect of, um, of um, uh, the region, etc. Et it's, um, it's a key player in the sense of, in Africa, there is a, an, off, an unofficial economy, and an official economy also, and um, there is three parts, the economical um, contribution, the knowledge transfer and skills development, and also uh, entrepreneurship that can help uh, the digital infrastructure, on the economical uh, contribu contribution, you have uh, 40 billion uh, per year of, uh, that are uh, fueled into the African economy just by the African uh, diaspora, which is quite uh, often more than what um, direct foreign investment or uh, international de development paid, uh, put in. Part of those funds could be directly fueled into uh, whether it's education or collaboration or uh, investment in the, in the digital infrastructure sector. As an example, for example, uh, Repath Africa, which I represent today, uh, we invested in, in an e-vehicle, African EV, uh, EV uh, venture. Uh, in, maybe it's not so much uh, finances, but it's about 120k in just one day. And it's only 300, uh, 350 people. So imagine all the association and investment funds. So I think that part is quite uh, important. On the knowledge tra transfer and skills also um, development, um, the fact that many uh, diaspora members uh, have access to advanced skills and expertise that, that can be uh, transferred on the continent more easily because of the cultural aspect uh, and also the, the knowledge of tailored uh, education that is needed depending on the regions and also uh, knowing the, um, having access to the, the local uh, communities and also local stakeholders. Uh, usually in Africa, if you don't know someone, you'll never get somewhere. So that's quite a part and it could be enhancing and also be more secure for um, uh, education and project to, to, to succeed. Uh, uh, because uh, the, the fact that you would be close to the population and the stakeholders, it could be um, a good collaboration between the international organization, the diaspora, and people inside. Uh, the last one is the entrepreneurship side. A lot of uh, people in the diaspora are entrepreneurs and uh, are fueling the economy and also creating jobs. Part of those entrepreneurs could be directed into the digital infrastructure and could be um, fueling the digital industry by, for example, being electricians. Uh, it's as simple as that. But they need to know that this digital infrastructure is there. Uh, it's accessible to them because I'm not sure they know that they could access to it. And uh, of course, there are challenges and opportunity. Uh, the opportunity, sorry, is that blending of the international. Uh, cultural, socio-economical context 
and um, the local context also for the diaspora, um, and also uh, helping to ensure the success. I think I, I'm repeating myself. So success of a project, but uh, there are also the challenges are on the policy and regulations, uh, it could be uh, a big help for African governments to push laws that could help the diaspora to, to be even more uh, willing to get back to the continent and invest uh, and also clear the bureaucracy and if I can finish like this. Thank you, Stella. And I think the key message there is just not to underestimate the power of local people at home. Yeah. Um, and in order that, that is a key to unlocking a lot of this investment on the continent is, is having those relationships and using those relationships to help push forward your opportunities and um, strengthen uh, related ties, whether it's with government or local communities or whatever it might be, to make sure that our, our projects that we're all very passionate about get going and, um, and attract investment from every area, especially those who are passionate about it. Uh, yeah, and a passionate, uh, yeah, passionate a lot people that can be who, really that. Want, uh, who really want to do something for their home country or a home continent. Yeah. And, and I, I see that time and time again um, when I'm around the continent. So, um, Walter, I, I feel like we only just touched the surface of what you were going to say today, so I think we should come back to you and we'll, we'll come back you know, feel free now, panel, just to kind of jump in um, as you as you would like to. But well, to, you're in a number of jurisdictions across the continent, as you've, you've just mentioned, mentioned, and you're clearly very passionate about this um, sector now um, across the continent and ensuring that Africa isn't left behind and, and the the market moves forward. With these, with the growth aspect of that, what what do you see as your like key? key points you want to raise for, for the audience today, or, or do you have bugbears that you want to air that you think others can have um, some words of wisdom on? Yeah, the, the, the exciting thing about the continent, of course, is that the data center opportunity exists in every jurisdiction, so that's 54 countries, but they're all in a different state of development. Yeah, South Africa being more spurs developing, yeah, really having exploded in re recent years with the, the 10 uh, plus megawatt data centers now being built. Uh, so that's, that's absolutely very exciting about the continent. You know, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we've, we've talked about six jurisdictions, of course PECS wants to go to 28, and more than half of all the countries in the African continent. It's a big enough challenge uh, for a few, a few years ahead. Uh, and, th and then of course it's uh, the, the key, key topics that are uh, interesting to highlight at this point. I think it's you know, the, the regulatory change that's uh, taking place that's really opening up the opportunity. And what you see in South Africa, those ideas are, are, are spreading to other countries. And the fact that we were able to enter uh, uh, Djibouti is also because uh, the uh, Djibouti government has seen the light and, and seen the opportunity that you know, it's, 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 a hub, it's a connectivity hub. There's 120 million Ethiopians uh, needing access uh, to the internet and a lot, that, a lot of that traffic goes through, Ethiopia, uh, through Djibouti. And so uh, the minister of, from Djibouti visited Marseille as a project I worked on uh, 10 years ago, that worked out quite well. And now they're keen to develop a Marseille uh, uh, kind of model in, in Djibouti. So it, these are all signals that, you know, the, the thinking is there, the understanding is there. We've got some amazing uh, cases uh, happening. Uh, Rwanda, the President Kagame, what he hosted last, uh, last week in, 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 in Kigali was amazing to show, you know, what is possible when you educate, when you put the right regulations in place, you bring the, the people together who can actually you know, coordinate the, the development and that the source is a great investment opportunity uh, put together. So, uh, Any bugbears? Anything you want to ask for? Do you need more investment? Uh, do you need more support for government? What, what do we need? So our Series B was two years ago, so our Series C is starting uh, tomorrow. Um, no, look, I think there's two things that probably cause me some concern. I think one is the um, critical variation in the size of domestic, domestic savings pools across the continent. And if you look at, say, a market like South Africa, there's about $300 billion of assets under management in the local pension system. Um, but if you go to the next biggest market, it's probably Nigeria, and it'll be, you know, some 200 
20 or maybe 30 billion dollars. So, and you know, I think the point I make there is that domestic um, savings are crucial because currency exposure is very difficult to constantly mobilize capital for um, when a lot of the currencies face quite a lot of volatility. And so I think, um, you know, given products which can allow dollar investors to access these markets with some kind of currency protection, those would be very welcome additions. Um, and then the second, I guess, concern that I have is that, you know, as allocators of capital, we, we need to be ruthlessly commercial. We have to deliver returns to our investors. Um, but one of the biggest challenges in Africa is the digital divide, as was mentioned during the IFC session um, a while ago. And I think one of the biggest reasons for the digital divide is, is downstream affordability for products. So having a capacity gap doesn't equate to a good investment opportunity if the downstream markets can't afford um, that infrastructure. And I think um, if you look at uh, how many people in each country in Africa can afford to spend more than $10 a day, the numbers are, are trivially small, um, even in comparison to other emerging markets like Brazil or India. Um, and this is a constraint. Um, and I think our sense on this is that there are a number of players trying to pursue those strategies and starting at the bottom of the pyramid, but they're very, very difficult strategies to make work. Our, um, at least house view, is that with densification of networks, we can gradually uh, pro progress down the pyramid. But I think the, the IFC presentation on the first, third, second, third, etc., articulated this quite neatly. Um, and I think our focus as a business, um, if you look at our fiber networks, which, which are admittedly in South Africa and by and large target high disposable income cons uh, consumers, um, we are finding that as our network grows, we're in a position to provide lower cost solutions into adjacent markets and we've paid for the infrastructure against, shall we say, communities that can afford it. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity with densification and with scale that will allow us to solve this. But those are my two top concerns. So, so it's a good, good point about the affordability and, 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 the, and the savings that need to stay in country. So one of the comments last week was uh, a lot of the, the savings from the African continent are being uh, uh, stored somewhere else. And that doesn't help, of course, if uh, all the money is being put into Switzerland, the Swiss bank accounts or elsewhere. Uh, on, on, on the demand side, of course, as, as PECs, we're fortunate that we have as a main shareholder a company called Africa 50, which is a fund that was uh, named after the 50th anniversary of the African Union. So this has uh, 32 African governments, uh, two central banks and African development bank as uh, shareholders. And uh, that is really helping in, in, the, in, in the play, in encouraging the governments to digitize and bring everything online. I mean, what's happening in Rwanda is amazing. Everything is available online. And, uh, and that's, of course, the whole world of other countries. What it does though for pricing is actually pricing is pretty good in all these markets. There's a whole, whole group of smaller companies have a little trouble affording it, but actually our, my, my, the ARPU per cabinet in, some, in Ghana is higher than I've seen anywhere in Europe. So the, there's probably still the same divide of that, that first third and maybe some of the second third of your customer base, and then what do we do about the rest? And that's maybe where we need to be looking more towards the grants and the concessionary debt um, that, that people like IOC, as many others, um, can, can provide. Um, and maybe, Fabian, you, you can talk about maybe some of the opportunity or, or products that, that FinFund and, and the European Union is currently thinking about to offer to support some of these issues. I don't know if there's one on FX or if there are other types of um, support you can talk about. Yeah, sure, sure. I think Maybe just to, to, to add one point regarding the pricing, I think it, it depends on country by country, but there's usually a bottleneck somewhere in the, in the, in the value chain between the infrastructure and the end user, and it may be just on, on, on hand, on, on, on device availability, or on, on actual pricing of data, pricing of voice, and, but I, I do think that in the last couple of years, we've, we've seen a good push to, to privatize the sectors, to, to really clear out some inefficiencies, uh, from state-owned companies to, to allow for more competition and, and that has been driving prices down. I think we are not a, at, a, at a level yet that, that is healthy for the, for the end consumer, but we're slowly getting there. Um, and regarding your question, I think um, FinFund, like other DFIs, like IOC, we, we see ourselves as a, as a long-term capital partner to, to invest in those assets <coughs> and there's a, a really a, a bigger push also from the European Commission to, to invest 
in digital infra assets on the continent, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. For example, FinFund um, does have one guarantee program with the European Commission where we can basically uh, get a guarantee cover for our debt and equity and e investments that we can also share with, with our partners. Um, and I expect that, that, the, that the program and the size of it will expand over the next years. So it's, so it's really something that, that Europe tries to focus to and, and maybe coming back to a little bit of the, of the themes of, 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 of the panel tell us like geopolitical tensions. I, I think there's a clear incentive also from the US, from the, from the European Commission to, to push European vendors, to push Western vendors to, to have a foot in the door because if you, if you kind of lose this investment race and then have, for example, non-European vendors, namely Huawei, ZTE coming in, locking contracts, then, then it's difficult from a political angle, I think, to, to have a say in those countries. Um, Stella, just on the sort of downstream end user point, do you have any thoughts on how to not fix the problem but support um, measures to kind of get those services to the rural communities? And the, I mean, my experience is like so the home systems and, and mini grids in the power sector, you would look to get those out into those areas and then add the services onto those, you know, be it refrigeration or, or whatever it might be down the line. Um, is there a similar um, development structure for the, the digital infrastructure sector, or is there something new? Um, the problem thing, I think, at the end of the day, ties into is to, uh, <laughs> to to awareness into um, rural area. At the beginning of everything, it's awareness. As long as the people in the rural areas or the, the my French is coming back, uh, yeah. So for me, it's education and promotion to get to them and to them willing to participate in it. I I think that that's the thing. If they don't know, they don't they won't be willing to access to services. And, and spend their hard-earned dollars. Yes. A very few uh -huh. Exactly. Yeah. They, they need to understand why they, they can invest in that and what they will gain from that. And again, that's why I'm saying the diaspora is a good link. Because when we go back, we're the, we're the, the, the I don't know, the golden kids of it. And we act also as influencers, some kind of, and we can bring in good practices and education. And of course, we're not giving lessons here. We we also understand the the, the, the the context and and know how to listen to the context and work in partnership and not with all due respect coming in and saying what to do, which is not good at the moment. I've, I've um, witnessed that a few times. Um, so I'm really conscious that it's lunchtime almost. Do we have any questions from the room? Have we managed to say something you didn't agree with or that you have, have any question for our panelists? I think everyone is hungry. <laughs> Anyway, um, if we could just have a round of applause for our panellists this afternoon.